119 Nocturne Boulevard presents The Dunwich Horror by H.P. Lovecraft Adapted by Julie Overson One traveler in North Central Massachusetts takes the wrong fork at the junction of Aylesbury Pike, just beyond Dean's Corners. He comes upon a lonely and curious country. The ground gets higher and the briar-bordered stone walls press closer and closer against the ruts of the dusty, curving road. With Dave Marshall as Dr. Henry Armitage. Without knowing why, one hesitates to ask directions from the gnarled, solitary figures spied now and then on crumbling doorsteps or on the sloping, rock-strewn meadows. Glenn Hallstrom as Professor Warren Rice. Those figures are so silent and furtive that... One feels somehow confronted by forbidden things which it would be better to have nothing to do. Lothar Tuppen as Dr. Francis Morgan. Across a covered bridge, one sees a small village huddled between the stream and the vertical slope of Round Mountain, and wonders at the cluster of rotting gambrel roofs bespeaking an earlier architectural period than that of the neighboring region. And Lord Blood Ra as the voice of the Necronomicon. It is not reassuring to see, on closer glance, that most of the houses are deserted and falling to ruin, and that the broken steeple church now harbors the one slovenly mercantile establishment of the hamlet. Part one of four. Nor is it to be thought that man is either the oldest or the last of Earth's masters, or that the common bulk of life and substance walks alone. Is Professor Armitage here? Shh. Oh, sorry, Miss Ward. He just made it sound like it was urgent. He's in the Wexler Annex Conference Room, Professor Rice. You can take this to him. Is he doing well? He looks fragile. Back round there. Last door on the left. You tell him if he needs anything. Absolutely. Oh, it's you. Armitage? You look dreadful. I heard you've been ill since... Let's not go into that with the door open. Oh. Uh, yes. Uh, your box? Just set it down. We'll go into that when Morgan gets here. Come in, Morgan. Good God, Armitage, you look... Shut the door. Sit. You said it was urgent. First, I must ask both of you for an assurance that whether you choose to stay or leave, nothing I say here today will pass beyond this room. What? Uh, well, of course. Whatever you want. You know you can trust me, Henry. After that night, I... Uh, I'm... I I felt you were the only ones I could bring into this. After that night, we're already in this. Whatever that thing was... Are we in danger of being overheard? We can speak freely. I chose this room for its isolation. I need to tell you a story. About that night? You only saw a thing. I met that person... Twice before. Twice? You only mentioned... I only recalled the details of the first meeting very recently. A news article. One of many that made it into that box you so kindly brought along. Jogged an odd sliver of memory in this old brain. Several years ago, I... I... Yes? I... I will get back to that. Of more import is the recent encounter. Wilbur Waitley. (laughs) You should have seen the look on Miss Ward's face when that filthy, goatish monstrosity of a man ducked under the lintel of her sacred library and requested a very special book. The what? The Necronomicon. I read doubt is to be found in your special books collection. I can't just let you in. That collection is restricted. Someone would have to escort you. I can read it myself. That is not the point. 
If you want to schedule a viewing, I can put you on the list. Is there a problem, Miss Ward? No, Professor. Nothing to worry yourself about. I've come for to see the Necronomicon. I told him he would have to make an appointment. I have a bit of free time. Why don't I just take him? I knew you would query me about my motives. He was an interesting type. Not the person you might expect to see in a library to begin with. And I'd heard him declare he could read the book. I gave in to curiosity, pure and simple. Perhaps also a touch of cruel humor. Even I am not immune from the odd, I told you so. Didn't anyone notice there was something very wrong with him? You did say something about ducking under doors. You only saw him an extremist. To us, then, he was simply a very tall, ugly man in a rather bulky, cheap suit who looked and smelled like he'd walked all the way from a farmyard. Tall? Ha! <laughs> Those doors are nearly eight feet. I had to help move a shelf through there once. I decided to test him. We were in the reading room, and I seated him at the table. So, you were looking for the English version of the, uh, Necronomicon? This? No, this is not right. You have your own copy? I needs to compare. Can I see the Latin version of Olus Vermius? I don't read the Arabic, but I think the Latin will suffice. To say I was stunned that this hillbilly would walk in with a copy of the rare Dr. D translation of the Necronomicon carried so carelessly in a cheap valise... It was, it was in wretched condition, but appeared to be intact. So stunned that you let him see the book? I had always intended to let him see the book, and now that I had found he was no mere thrill-seeker, I was overwhelmed with curiosity as to what precisely he was expecting to find in it. Can I help you locate whatever you're looking for? I can do it. I'm very familiar with the Latin edition. Yeah. There's a passage comes on page 751 in the Doc D. Taint right. I needs to see where it came from afore. Here. I believe that would be in a section on incantations. Uh, somewhere in this area? Tis one what calls upon Doc Sothoth. There's a number of those. I can find it. But though he poured over the two volumes well over an hour, it was more confusing than helpful. There were apparently discrepancies, duplications, and ambiguities in the D-translation, which made the matter of determining which passage matched which far from easy. As he copied the formula, he finally settled on, I, I, I couldn't help but read over his shoulder. It was a very terrible section. The old ones were, the old ones are, and the old ones shall be. Not in the spaces we know, but between them. They walk serene and primal, undimensioned, and to us, unseen. It contains such monstrous threats to the peace and sanity of the world. yog Sothoth knows the gate. Yog sothoth is the gate. Yog sothoth is the key and guardian of the gate. Past, present, future, all are one in Yog sothoth But everything I read was nothing to the horror I felt when Wilbur spoke once more. Mr. Armitage, I calculate I got to take this book home. There's things in it I've got to try under certain conditions that I can't get here, and... It'd be a mortal sin to let a red tape rule hold me up. You must remember what I was faced with. The bent, goatish giant before me seemed like the spawn of another planet or dimension, like something only partly of mankind and linked to black gulfs of essence and entity. By their smell can men sometimes know them near, but of their semblance can no man know, saving only in the features of those they have begotten on mankind. And of those are there many sorts, differing in likeness from man's truest idolon to that shape without sight or substance, which is them. 
On top of his appearance, he was the strangest mixture of craft and guilelessness I have ever encountered. While he clearly had a deep streak of cunning, he seemed to have no concept of just how outlandish his request truly was. Let me take it along, sir, and I'll swear they won't nobody know the difference. I don't need to tell you, I'll take good care of it. Swan it want me to put this D copy in the shape it is. They walk unseen and foul in lonely places where the words have been spoken and the rites howled through at their seasons. Great Cthulhu is their cousin, yet can he spy them only dimly. Something in his voice was so wrong, like it was coming from a set of pipes that never belonged in a human throat. He must have seen it in my face, that I would never give in. Well, all right, if you feel that way about it. Maybe Harvard won't be so fussy as you be. But his look. I didn't like his look. Without saying more, he rose and strode out of the building, stooping at each doorway. I locked away the Necronomicon with a shudder of disgust, but the room still reeked with an unholy and unidentifiable stench. Ea, shub niggeroth, as a foulness shall ye know them. Their hand is at your throats, yet ye see them not, and their habitation is even one with your guarded threshold. It was that odor that finally brought back the memory of my trip to Dunwich years before. That same odor that sickened me at the Waitley farmhouse. But the Wilbur of that visit was yet a child, not the giant I had just met. So I hope to be forgiven for my mistake. Perhaps this Wilbur was the father. We can only be grateful it wasn't. Inbreeding? <laughs> Inbreeding? I doubt it. A different sort of miscegenation entirely. But what thing? What cursed, shapeless influence on or off this three-dimensional earth might have been Wilbur Waitley's father interested me greatly. The townsfolk seemed to be willing to overlook his innate oddity. Show the townsfolk Arthur Mackin's great god Pan, and they'll think it's a common Dunwich scandal. What walked the mountains that night that Wilbur was conceived? What rudderless horror fastened itself in the world in half-human flesh and blood? Taking notes? Some color. Might write it up as a story. Ah. I've gone back to the records for the precise details. He was born on Candlemas, nine months after a very significant May Eve. The talk about the queer noises in the hills reached clear to Ackham that year. Hill noises? It's all in the papers here. Newspaper articles, personal reports, uh, a few letters I've received from interested parties. Plenty of time to have them collected all during my illness. You still look ill, Armitage. Are you sure you're up to this? If we wait until I'm well again, and at my age, that could take quite some time. We may be too late. And so this Waitley, it, this is what came back to the library, but, but that was some kind of monster. I'm sure of it. What was left of the suit, not to mention the face, was unmistakable. I mentioned, I think, that the watchdog barked furiously each time Waitley passed near enough for it to smell him. You made some comment. Animals often have an aversion to things that are not uh, of this world. Horses, cats, dogs, geese, geese, whatever is merely the odor or something more deeply spiritual is beyond our meager senses. They simply cannot tolerate such outsiders. Geese. I knew a woman once who bought a house, but sold it right up again after her pet cat wouldn't set foot over the threshold. But this, you're asking us to believe a lot on faith, Professor. You saw it for yourself. I saw something. But until this moment, I'd almost managed to convince myself it was some sort of waking nightmare or group hallucination. And I can't say that finding otherwise is making me particularly happy. Perhaps I haven't been clear. This is not a mere series of interesting events. An evening amongst friends. This is deadly serious. You said as much in your summons. Ah, <sighs> my dear friends... I have asked for your oath of silence on these matters, but now, since the question has been raised, I want to give you the chance to leave. Leave? Nonsense. I didn't mean to say... This is a dark business I plan to lay before you, and the fate of everything may hang on it. 
I must know that I can count on you for your help. Whatever you need. You think we'd skeeve off and leave you to do everything? <laughs> no way, I'm in. <sighs> I am gratified. You see, if the Necronomicon is to be believed, there are always these outside forces, entities, trying to find a way into our world. And if they ever should get in, we will be... I can't think of a strong enough word just at the moment. And you believe this is what this Wilbur wanted, to open a way? After his death, they gave me his books to look over. Not that the authorities had had any inkling what was really going on. They just handed them over? I volunteered, saying that as I had spoken to the person, I might be able to decipher his writings. You see, among various other crumbling volumes, and his copy of the D... There was what appeared to be a journal. Appeared? It was written in a sort of cipher. Curious and curious, sir. The wind gibbers with their voices, and the earth mutters with their consciousness. They bend the forest and crush the city, yet may not forest or city behold the hand that smites. And so we come to The Night in the Library. When you say it like that, it sounds like the title of a thriller. And what novels are you reading that show that night wasn't thrilling? <laughs> it was a night that I doubt even the most hardened of pulp aficionados wouldn't have blanched at. Reality is considerably more blanche-worthy than a book, and more smelly. I had received word before that night of Waitley's grotesque trip to Cambridge and of his frantic efforts to borrow or copy from the Necronomicon at the Widener Library. I must admit those efforts had been in vain, mainly due to my interference. I had taken the precaution of sending warnings of the keenest intensity to all librarians having charge of the dreaded volume. Good idea. Old Brewster wrote me that Wilbur had been shockingly nervous at Cambridge, anxious for the book, yet almost equally anxious to get home again, as if he feared the results of being away long. There are time constraints for certain rituals and spells, aren't there? I have a strong feeling his need to get back was more visceral than a simple date on a calendar. There's no particular astronomical convergence this year that will not happen again. No eclipses or one-of-a-kind phenomena. Of course you looked into all that. I did. You always were a thorough researcher. Regardless of the cause, his time constraint forced him into foolhardy action. I am going to digress here for a moment regarding my prior meeting with Waitley. What, just when we're coming up on our entrance into the play? Bear with me. I will be brief. I believe it was nearly a decade ago. The precise date will be in the papers in the box there, when the government was conscripting men for the army. Oh, I recalled that. We lost some very promising scholars. Squire Sawyer Waitley. Inbreeding. I knew it. As chairman of the local draft board, had hard work finding a quota of young Dunwich men fit even to be sent to a development camp. But they're all farmers, aren't they? Farm boys are usually healthy and sturdy. Not in Dunwich. Alarmed at such signs of wholesale regional decadence, the government sent several officers and medical experts to investigate. I wasn't with that party, but went down as a result of their reports. Those are in the box, too? Yes, but one of the few men who might be deemed worthy material was Wilbur Waitley. But he had to be passed over due to his age and the resistance of his family. His age? You didn't make him sound that old. Wilbur looked like a lad in his late teens. His lips and cheeks were fuzzy, with a coarse dark down, and his voice had begun to break. Ah, and they wouldn't take him being a few months shy of sixteen years old, eh? By somewhat over a decade. Pardon? Wilbur was a child of four and a half. Their semblance can no man know, saving only in the features of those they have begotten on mankind. I... I can hardly credit it. Could it have been some kind of ruse? Something to keep him from being conscripted? From what little I could glean from the locals, a reticent bunch, even the ones who dislike Wilbur's family, and that includes most of the nearby town, there was no ruse. Besides, even backwards folk would know better than to take quite so many years off when one or two might do. True enough. What's more important is that the year of Wilbur's birth had one of those convergences I spoke of earlier. Did it? A minor one. Not something the average person would ever notice, or that would make the papers. But it fell on May Eve, the May Eve of his conception. And that 
was the foothold. So what came of all this? I mean, obviously the draft didn't take Wilbur. All in all, not much. The Boston Globe and Arkham Advertiser printed flamboyant Sunday stories of young Wilbur's precociousness, his grandfather's propensity for black magic, and the weirdness of the whole region and its hill noises. You mentioned that before. What are these noises? I don't want to digress too far, but this is something that has some bearing on what might be to come. This whole mess is like a series of boxes within boxes. Each one we open shows us three more. Their hand is at your throats, yet ye see them not, and their habitation is even one with your garden threshold. It is said that under certain circumstances, the hills surrounding Dunwich make deep rumbling and cracking noises, noises which geologists have consistently failed to explain. What circumstances? Are, are they volcanic? There are no living volcanoes on the East Coast, not for millennia. Nothing so rational. No, old legends speak of unhallowed rites and conclaves of the Indians, amidst which they called forbidden shapes of shadow out of the great rounded hills, and made wild orgiastic prayers that were answered by loud crackings and rumblings from the ground below. Mm, hill giants! In fact, deposits of skulls and bones found within circles of huge standing stones that crown several of the surrounding hills, and around the sizable table-like rock on Sentinel Hill, sustained the popular belief that such spots were once the burial places of the local natives. Perhaps the Pocomtucks. Always easy to blame indigenous peoples. Have there been archaeological digs in the area? Nothing significant. Due to the remote location, the sullen disinterest of the locals and the unclean atmosphere, the few abortive attempts that have been made have come up with conflicting evidence. Evidence? They found what appeared to be Caucasian bones in among the remains in some of the burial heaps. The establishment wrote it off as locals using a convenient place to dump their own departed ancestors, deciding it was too compromised to learn anything of value and won't fund further exploration. He knows where the old ones broke through of old and where they shall break through again. I apologize for my tendency to go off on tangents. Take it that the hills sometimes make these noises, and recall that the hill noises at the time of Wilbur's birth were so noticeable that word spread as far as Arkham. It is both a sign of the local weirdness, the strange beliefs, and oddly, a validation of the claims of Wilbur's unusually tender age. Good enough. I'm not sure I believe it, but I'll entertain the hypothesis. Good. Let's jump ahead to your entrance into the drama. As I think you suggested we do nearly half an hour ago. I'm not so long in my professorial chair that I've lost the student's knack of listening. Good, good. Now, what do you recall of that night, before the incident? I heard the dogs. I as well. <sighs> if there was time, we might do well to procure a couple of good hunting dogs. But I have a sense that we are already on borrowed time. Why hash over that night? We were all there. It may help us to, uh, I hope, identify what precisely we're dealing with. Point. We were all woken up by the dogs. They kicked up a wicked row. Good. Dogs, noted. You kept everyone else out, Armitage. Didn't see any but you two, who I thought I could trust to keep your heads. <laughs> yeah, trust us to face a monster of some sort. I wasn't certain. That's a dubious compliment at best. Uh, keep going. There was also the burglar alarm. We came into the library to find the dogs going at a thing. I heard a scream. At least I guess that's the best name you could give it. it. Certainly didn't sound the least bit human. Human? No. There rang out a scream that roused half the sleepers of Arkham and halted their dreams ever afterwards. Such a scream as could come from no being born of Earth or wholly of Earth. It would be trite and not wholly accurate to say that no human pen could describe it. But one may properly say that it could not be vividly visualized by anyone whose ideas of aspect and contour are too closely bound up with the common life forms of this planet. I think there were birds, too. Whippoorwills. I remember thinking how odd it was that they would be out in the middle of the night. There's something mythological described to whippoorwills, isn't there? We'll come back to the whippoorwills. There was also a stench. Yes, it was terrible. So awful that I was barely able to force my fingers to turn the light switch. I'm sure I shrieked. 
I wholly lost consciousness for a moment. Terror strikes each man differently, and there, among overturned chairs and wild disorder... There were bits of clothing and shoe leather all over the floor. The dog had really danced the tarantella on this... thing. There lay... The thing that lay half-bent on its side in a fetid pool of greenish-yellow ichor and tarry stickiness was almost nine feet tall, and the dog had torn off all the clothing and some of the skin. It twitched silently and spasmodically while its chest heaved in monstrous unison with the mad piping of the expectant whippoorwills outside. Oh, I recall. It wasn't quite... dead. But nearly there. No saving it, even if we could have brought ourselves to touch it. I would say that apart from the relatively manlike head and hands, there was very little about Wilbur that was human. I spotted a revolver. Later discovered it when it was jammed. Surprised it didn't explode in his... its... hand. The legs were vaguely goat-like, curved and pelted with dark fur. But those weren't hooves it had for feet, cloven or otherwise. More sort of pads. The chest had a texture reminiscent of a crocodile or alligator, but the yellow and black markings reminded one more of the squamous covering of certain snakes. Below the waist, though, was the worst, for here all human resemblance left off and sheer fantasy began. The skin was thickly covered with coarse black fur, and from the abdomen, a score of long greenish gray tentacles with red sucking mouths protruded limply. And once it expired, it vanished. Melted, I would call it. Disintegration. Slow yet right before our eyes. Not a bit of it left by the time we'd recovered enough of our wits to try and decide what to do about it. Nothing left but stain and stench. True. That floor will never be the same. There's already talk of having the boards up and replaced. The lack of hard evidence is the primary reason I have not been able to bring myself to speak much on this to the authorities. Such a wild tale would get me nowhere. I feel the same. Oh, it would get you somewhere, all right. Locked up, that's where it would get you. And this is why you two are the only ones I can confide in. There at the last, while the whippoorwill shrieked and the dog growled, it spoke. The dog? The it. Nothing in English of that, I am certain. But there were some disjointed fragments from the Necronomicon, that monstrous blasphemy in quest of which the thing had perished. They trailed off into nothingness as the whippoorwill shrieked in rhythmical crescendos of unholy anticipation. You said you'd mention... Whippoorwills are psychopomps, lying in wait for the souls of the dying. At the moment of death, they try to steal away the escaping soul. And this thing? As it heaved its final breath, the shrilling of the whippoorwill suddenly ceased, and above the murmurs of the gathering crowd outside... I could hear a panic-struck whirring and fluttering. As if they fled in fear from the soul which they had sought for prey. And then it disintegrated. The really human element in Wilbur Whaley must have been very small indeed. Even by the time the police surgeon arrived, there was only a sticky whitish mass on the painted boards, and the monstrous odor had nearly disappeared. Apparently Whaley had had no skull or bony skeleton, not in any true or stable sense. He had taken somewhat after his unknown father. While I appreciate your need to discuss this, to unburden yourself a bit and share the load, I... well... Uh... Is there something in the journal we need to know about? We can go into that in the morning. There will be plenty of time on the long drive. Drive? Excuse me? We are going to travel to Dunwich. Endeth Part 1 of The Dunwich Horror, from the classic story by H.P. Lovecraft, adapted by Julie Hoverson. In The Dunwich Horror, Professor Henry Armitage was Dave Marshall, 
Professor Warren Rice was Glenn Hallstrom. Dr. Francis Morgan was Lothar Tuppen. The voice of the Necronomicon is Lord Bloodraw. Wilbur Waitley was Danner Hoverson. Wizard Waitley is Charles Austin. Lavinia Waitley is Julie Hoverson. Miss Ward is Elise Crawick. Mrs. Armitage is Chris Kepler. Dr. Hartwell is Chris Lackey of the H.P. Lovecraft Literary Podcast. Curtis Waitley is J. Spider Isaacson. Mamie Bishop is Beverly Poole. Earl Sawyer was Rick Lewis. Silas Bishop is Eli Nilsson. Joe Osborne is Renaud LaBeouf. Mrs. Corey is Robin Keyes. Mrs. Fry is Kimberly Poole of Warped Space. Luther Corey is Matthias Rebney Morgan. Widow Zebulon is Reese T.M. Sally Bishop is Gwendolyn Jensen Woodard of Gypsy Audio. Chauncey Bishop is Mike Campbell. Officer Williams is Jack and Kate of Edict Zero and Slipgate Nine Productions. Officer O'Reilly is Michael Coleman of Tales of the Extraordinary. The other police officer is Chad Pfeiffer of the H.P. Lovecraft Literary Podcast. Seth Bishop and additional voices by Mark Olson and the Dunwich Townsfolk. Music for the Dunwich Horror is by Kevin McLeod of Incompetech.com. The cover art is by Julie Hoverson. The ferocious guard dogs Quinn and Spencer Dutkowski appeared courtesy of their personal sound engineer, Donna. Additional effects by Henry Howard. No whippoorwills, alive or dead, were harmed in the making of this show. Much thanks to Fred Greenhog of Radio Drama Revival. Sound and mastering was done by Julie Hoverson. Sound effects were found at soundsnap.com, sonomic.com, and onesoundfx.com. All persons, places, and events in this story were fictitious or used in a fictitious manner and are not meant to reflect any persons, places, or things, living, dead, undead, or outside our three-dimensional realm. Questions? Comments? We would love to hear from you. Contact us at 19nocturne at live.com, that's 19nocturne, or visit our website at www.19nocturneboulevard.com. This presentation is copyright 2011 to Julie Hoverson and Reality Productions and is released under a Creative Commons non-commercial license. Spread the show around, but don't try to make money off it.